Hello, and welcome to the Movie Mouth Film and TV Podcast, a podcast where we discuss the latest movie news and reviews so that you don't have to waste three hours of your time deciding what to watch on Netflix tonight. This week, we're reviewing Spike Lee's new Netflix joint, The Five Bloods, Sir Ken Branagh's Disney Plus kids movie, Artemis Fowl, and Judd Apatow's new comedy, The King of Staten Island. This is Miles. This is Phil. And we're the only movie and TV related podcast who loves you 3,000 and will always, always be on your left. Did you hear that? Hear what? Well, just as I said that, the bombastic sounds of Alan Silvestri's Avengers Endgame score just started playing very loudly, and a large portal opened right behind me, now stood armed and ready to join me in the battle against monotonous quarantining and bad movies, is my fellow Avenger. Neither man, Norse god, or radioactivity-enhanced super soldier, a man so heroic he once saved me from a knife-wielding, death-threatening lunatic. <laughs> True story. It's the all-singing, all-dancing, web-slinging, lean green beast machine, the Phil Credible Hulk. <laughs> Good day. And how are you this week? Uh, I'm good, thanks. How, how are you doing? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm glad. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. still alive. So this week, we actually opened up our podcast to listener questions. Um, so we have a listener question this week. We're going to try to answer your questions as the podcast goes along. Um, so feel free to reach out through Instagram, Facebook, all the regular channels. Uh, with anything that you'd like to ask us, and we will endeavor to answer them with the worst movie-related answers possible. Uh, this week, Jasper in Barcelona would like to know, Hi, Phil and Miles. As a perennially hungry human being, nothing is more torturous than sitting at home in quarantine with empty kitchen cupboards and a lack of open restaurants, while watching a scene in a movie where actors are preparing or eating delicious food. If you could have any, what food from TV or film would you most want to eat and why? Phil. That's a good you question. Think? You hungry? Immediately sprung to my mind because it seems like the most fun option. You know, in, in uh, Hook, Robin Williams' Hook, <laughs> when they've got, uh, where they're all imagining the food and they get all that crazy multicolored, I don't know what it is. It's like gloop, sponge gloop in like crazy day glow colors i want to eat that i always wanted to eat that the sponge gloop sponge gloop colorful sponge gloop <laughs> well what does it taste like in your mind um well i think because of i think it tastes like anything you want it to taste like because of the uh because of yeah, the, what, what, the, what would you want it to taste like <laughs> i'd want it to taste like um Oh, maybe a, a nice curry or something. That'd be nice. Said like a true Englishman. <laughs> Lovely curry. You got any other ideas? Um, have I got any? Um, for food and films, Twinkies. Twinkies would be good. I mean, two I can think of. We've got Al in Die Hard 1 buying the Twinkies in the, uh, in the shop. Before it he knows every off. every single ingredient of the twenty. Everything a grown boy needs, right? Yeah, well, he's he, everything a grown boy needs, but he does uh, tell the the gas store attendant that he's buying them for his wife, and the attendant's like, "Yeah, sure, buddy, whatever." Yeah, I love that. Like, you're not because you're you're a cop. <laughs> uh, and then you know, still Twinkie related, Ghostbusters. Oh, you know, love it. I remember growing up watching that and uh, seeing a Twinkie and not even knowing what it was in England. It was the only video we had was Ghost, the first Ghostbusters movie at home. And yeah. just imagining what that was like. And I remember a Canadian friend he that I made in the town where I lived. He told me that basically a Twinkie was like a Cadbury's chocolate mini roll, <laughs> which actually isn't too far from the truth, but obviously no. without the, without the chocolate. I guess it's more of a ding dong. What about like a, what was stuck in a mini roll, but not a chocolate one? Exactly. <laughs> the first time I had a Twinkie, do you know when that was? No. It it was when I came to visit you in New York. That's the first time you've ever had a Twinkie? That's the first time I ever had a Twinkie. So that was wow. only, what, like two years ago? Wow. 
That's insane. And uh, I went through all my life really wanted and a Twinkie. Was it everything that you ever imagined? It was right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing special. I've got some. Uh, I've got some thoughts on this. Mm. I'm. I'm usually pretty hungry. Most of mine revolve around fast food, to be honest. Opening <laughs> yep. scene to Pulp Fiction, Big Kahuna Burger, um, and the mm. way Sam Jackson bites into that burger and then washes it down with the tasty Sprite beverage. Um, yeah, just it makes me so hungry and thirsty at the same time. Also, um, <laughs> one of my favorite ever Marty, Marty Scorsese movies, Goodfellas, the prison scene. Where they make the uh, the Italian uh, pasta course with the meat or the fish, and then you get Paulie slicing the garlic with a razor blade, and uh, the the kind of voiceover from Ray Liotta says that he slices it so thin that it would liquefy in a pan with just a little oil, Ooh. and uh, they've got like fresh meat and fish and lobster on ice in the back of the prison cell, which is just awesome. <laughs> Um, and then also one, probably a, a bit like your Ghostbusters one, which is kind of cultural, a cultural difference between the UK and the US, is the scene in Twister, the Bill Paxton storm chasing movie, mm. where just after we see the cow, the, the flying cows stuck in the tornado, oh, yeah. we, we cut cow. to, yeah, we cut to a breakfast scene with the storm chasers eating steak and eggs for breakfast around a table. And I, I grew up in England, so obviously... That wasn't a standard breakfast there. I mean, it was kind of crazy when I was a kid, but I was desperate for it. And I remember when I first moved to to the US, um, it became like my initial infatuation. I'd go to a diner and order steak and <laughs> eggs for breakfast and just sit there thinking that I was Bill Paxton in in Twister. So yeah, the, yeah I guess the real answer to this is, is that we, we never grew up <laughs> and, we, and we need to get a life. Yeah. But thanks for that question and and obviously keep, keep them coming. Um, what have you been watching this week, Phil? This week, watching, I've, obviously, we've been watching films for review. Oh, yeah. And that's actually taken up a, a big part of the week this week. A um, lot of films. But other than that, I've um, I've been watching a few trailers, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about in a minute anyway. But what, what, So, yeah, really, nothing majorly new for me this week. What about you? Throw a bit of a curveball on this one, because... Uh, like you, we had a lot of film reviews to do this week, but also um, a friend of mine actually in Washington, D.C. recommended that I watch a trashy reality TV show on Netflix, which is, isn't is usually my thing. But in this case, the said trashy reality TV show is called Terrace House, and it's set in Japan, in Tokyo. Okay. Um, and you get basically three guys, three girls that move into this house, standard reality TV fare. Um, and over the course of a, a set period of time, we kind of see them take each other out on dates and mingle and that kind of thing. And, and it's actually really interesting because yes, it's trashy. Um, but also the cultural differences between Japan, the UK, the U S and the reality TV shows, they're actually a lot, a lot smaller than you would, you would think, but also the big cultural differences in how people interact in, in Japan, which, which I absolutely loved. And Japan was already my number one on the list, but now I'm just absolutely blue balling to travel to Japan yeah. when all of this, this stuff is over. So I'd love to go there. Oh, me too. So if, it, you know, if anyone's interested in either that culture or um, reality TV shows or just something to pass the time, I really recommend Terrace House on, on Netflix. So you mentioned trailers. What, uh, what trailers have you, uh, you, you viewed this week? So a couple of, uh, well, one particularly fun one, <laughs> which I've actually been, uh, like a guilty pleasure looking forward to is the trailer for uh, Eurovision Song Contest, the story of Fire Saga. <laughs> so this is the new um, Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams film. It's going to be on Netflix. And uh, yeah, I mean, they'd released like a, I don't know if you'd seen it, but they'd released a music video a few weeks ago to do with the film. But now this was the uh, the full trailer that they released uh, in anticipation, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the look of that. Um, it just looks like it's going to be quite ridiculous, but sort of up my street ridiculous, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I'm up for Will Ferrell being ridiculous in anything, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then, other than that, so what else did I watch uh, trailer wise? Saw the trailer for um, You Should Have Left. 
which is the new uh, Kevin. I think you saw this, didn't you? Because you, you mentioned it to me. The uh, Kevin Bacon and uh, Amanda Seyfried film. Mm. Uh, and that looked, that looked pretty interesting. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it looks like a, a haunted house movie where the house is haunting the man. <laughs> yeah. Quite interesting. Um, yeah. Kevin Bacon in Wales, also interesting. Yeah. Um, it's I know it's a Blumhouse uh, produced sh- uh, movie, so obviously a lot of those kind of horrors, the Insidiouses of the world, the Conjurings, um, they're all made on a shoestring budget, usually for around $5 million, and they get a huge return at the box office because of that. Um, and it's also interesting to note this directed by David Kep, who directed Kevin Bacon in Stir of Echoes in the in the late 90s. And can you name the movie or the movie that probably inspired a lot of us in our childhoods that David Kep wrote the screenplay for? It was, I do know this, it was Jurassic Park, wasn't it? Welcome to Jurassic Park. It was indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably my favourite movie. I was hoping you'd call me a, a clever girl then. Clever girl. <laughs> I also saw the trailer for seventy five hundred or seven five zero zero, depending on where you're based. The Joseph Gordon Levitt yes. German plane being hijacked, um, which is being released on Amazon Prime next week. That looks pretty tense. Looked like a yeah, it does panic attack in a movie, especially for people that are terrified of flying in. Uh, these small metal tubes, 35,000 feet in the air for long periods of time, <laughs> like myself. Yeah, it does look good. And isn't it entirely set in the cockpit of the plane? It looks like that from that. Yeah, from that approach, yeah. it looks like it. Yeah, it does Although it's some, you never know. You see these trailers and then at the end of the day, the, the end of the movie, you may see Joseph Gordon-Levitt wing walking, f- <laughs> having a fist fight with a terrorist. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, sign me up for that one. <laughs> Any other trailers you've seen? So uh, the other trailer, I'm trying to name, remember the name of the film. It was, uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Ah, is this the one that it might have also a plane involved in it <laughs> yeah. and also money? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's it. Oh, thanks for the hint there. Uh, <laughs> money plane. Yeah. So this film, uh, someone I saw someone post a link to the trailer on my Facebook feed, and I was like, "What's this a film with?" Uh... It, it's but it but <laughs> it's hard to uh, fathom this film. Give us the plot. The plot is a heist uh, on a casino on a plane, <laughs> <laughs> which is great to start with. The lead actor in it is former. Uh, WWF or maybe current. I don't know. I don't keep up with WWF, but yeah, he, uh, Edge. And I don't even know his real name. What's his real name? Adam Copeland. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Uh, also starring Denise Richards. Fair enough. And then <laughs> Dr. Christmas Jones. <laughs> Dr. Christmas Jones. And Kelsey Grammer. Of course. And I know, you know, Kelsey Grammer's done a few of those sort of like support action roles, like in the Expendables and stuff. But this just looks insane. Like insanely bad for a star, but also I do really want to see it. Now you 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 text me about this, and I was I was walking around Manhattan at the time, and you text me basically exactly what you just said to me in that in that kind of drip feedy way, and I was already sold from the first message that you sent me about the heist taking place on a plane that also has a casino inside it. Yeah, and then you told me Edge was in it. Then you told me Kelsey Kelsey Graham, and I was literally punching the air in the in the street. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it looks terrible. I watched the trailer; it looks awful. I mean, it looks it does, really yeah. bad. It does, but that also I think is a reason <laughs> to watch it and review it in a later edition of the podcast. Definitely, just for shits and gigs. Um, yeah. but I'm absolutely up for that. I saw um, I saw some actual Star Wars news, which um, people may be switching off in their droves as they listen to us now, because I think Star Wars. Um, as a as a movie concept is has jumped the shark considerably, um, but in in this case the the new trilogy which has been rumored to um, to, to launch under the watchful eye of Ryan Johnson, um, which is certainly an area of concern for a lot of Star Wars fans that didn't like the Last Jedi, which he also directed. 
Um, but the there was a leak apparently from a very reputable source uh, that has also been uh, responsible for a number of leaks around the last couple of Star Wars movies uh, at Lucasfilm. Right. And the allegedly the plot revolves around a middle aged Ray teaching Broom Boy from the end of the Last Jedi to become a Jedi Knight in order to take down Ray's own daughter who has succumbed to the dark side and is now supreme leader of the First Order. Mm. So, as I say, take that with a pinch of salt, but it's it's fresh news that we heard here at Movie Mouth. Um, it has come from a, from a very reputable leak. Um, personally, it sounds like the plot of every other Star Wars movie that's <laughs> ever been. Yeah. So I don't see them really moving in that direction. Um, but you know, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Could be interesting. So the other thing I heard this week, uh, is that it could be, you know, due to the current situation with, uh, us not being mm. able to go to the cinema at the moment, I got a, um, message from, um, a company a couple of years ago. I think I mentioned it before actually, but I went to see, uh, some f- uh, outdoor screenings of some films, like a pop-up cinema type company. Hmm. And they're going to be uh, introducing a new indoor drive-in cinema. And I think, because I've, I've read a couple of articles about this, about sort of, you know, that drive-in cinemas could be the way forward for cinema hmm. going for a little bit until, you know, things settle down and get a bit back to normality. But I can see that being really popular, especially over here in the UK, because it's such a, well, everywhere, obviously. But I mean, the UK hasn't really got anything like that. It never really has either. You know, I think over here in the UK, we see drive-in cinema as a bit of like a, it just looks like a really cool sort of thing that happens in American films, you know? Mm, yeah. So I, th- I could see that doing really well. I mean, they're talking about doing it with films as well as like comedy shows and other things as well. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, sports, quite, it's, it's, it's a great idea for social distancing. Yeah. It means that people can still go out and actually do something, um, you know, and, and obviously keep it, keep a safe distance. Um, you know, the interesting ideas of actually going to these places and sitting in like a bubble or even a car that's actually been parked there for you to sit in, um, and obviously sterilized <laughs> is quite interesting as well. I like the idea of, I quite like the idea of it at least getting back into the, the movie going experience for me is, is something that I definitely miss. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. They're doing it here. I know there's a few happening here in New York. Um, there's a pop-up cinema in Queens that that's recently opened that a, a few of my friends are talking about going out to, um, for, for a couple of double bills. Uh, they're showing a lot of kind of classic movies out there. Right. Um, like, you know, fun times at, at Ridgemont high and, oh, yeah. and things like that, which is, which is pretty funny. I think the Goonies is coming up actually next weekend or, Brilliant. um, which, which could be, which could be a good one. So yeah, I love it. Love the idea. And, you know, I think really miss the, really miss, miss that experience. And I know that drive-in movies have been kind of trying to take off in the UK for a long time and probably in certain places of the world. So maybe it's a good option to do. Yeah. I think the problem with here is that we just don't have the weather for it generally either. You know, I think, and um, with it, this being indoor drive-in cinemas, it opens it up to a lot more sort of, you know, a lot more venues, I think. So, yeah. Quite yeah, exciting. I mean, it, depend, it depends what the movie is. You might be watching, you know, the uh, the, the day after tomorrow in, in the snow, and that would be like a full 4D experience while you're That's sitting true. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. <laughs> so... Let's jump into this week's reviews. Uh, we've we've got quite a quite a lot to get into this week. This week, a slight change in format, so we're not going to be reviewing one particular film or TV show. We're going to be reviewing a whole host of them, um, and we're going to start with uh, the King of Staten Island, which is uh, Judd Apatow, his latest uh, comedy. He's a co-writer and director of this. Obviously, he. Uh, previously directed Knocked Up, Trainwreck, 40-Year-Old Virgin, This Is 40, Funny People. Um, and he brings us his latest comedy, this time starring the Saturday Night Live uh, alumnus Pete Davidson as Scott. Um, and this is more more of a drama than an all-out comedy about a 24-year-old pothead 
um, whose life has never really got started. He's depressed, addicted to marijuana, suffering from ADHD, um, none of which usually makes for lols, so to speak. Um, (laughs) But in this case, it's better if you lower your expectation from balls out comedy to to kind of Duplass Brothers levels of indie smirking and and brow furrowing. Um, That I think, you know, as a movie, it's slightly overlong takes its time setting everything up um, and then to some extent rushes the emotional payoff of the finale slightly. Um, But I would say in the positives, Pete Davidson, who I think is very understated here, he also co-wrote this script. So he's gone through a lot of the issues here as well. Um, I think he's probably a better sketch or stand-up comedian than a true actor so far. And I say that, because let's not forget, he's only in his own, his early twenties. Yeah, I mean, I th- the only other thing I've seen him in, I think, is the um, uh, the Dirt, the Motley Crue uh, film that was a Netflix film, uh, and he played yes. the record label guy that sort of helped sign them. Um, that's right. Yes. Them. Yeah, that's the only yeah. other thing I think I've seen him in. Not a great movie that. <laughs> you didn't like it. I loved. Didn't it. love that movie. Yeah, it was good fun. I don't know. Um, it was easy to watch. Yeah. Um but I think his acting really comes alive in in scenes here with with the cast that they've assembled and in particular his friend with benefits who's played by Bell Powley uh who just kind of giggles at a lot of his jokes and and the reactions of of her as an actress really kind of bail um bail him out slightly but I would also say um another stand up comedian who's in this which is Bill Burr who's hugely popular here in, in the US he plays Scott's rival for his mother's affections. And he was seen most recently and somewhat surprisingly in the Disney plus star Wars series, the Mandalorian. Um, and, and actually he's, he's very, very good in this. So right. there's a really good cast. Um, there, there are kind of scenes where the reactions of, of that cast um, to a lot of the jokes and, and, and a lot of the kind of ruminations feel like lifelike real which gives it more of a, a lot of heart, I would say. It raises this above the more saccharine Hollywood comedies that are out there um, and, and actually deals with a lot of issues, issues that have, that have been close to me in the past, um, you know, family members dealing with addiction or depression, anxiety, trauma. Um, and and I, I was very moved by this. I, I'd say not only is this my favorite comedy of the year so far, and I use the term comedy very loosely, um, but it's also the best Judd Apatow movie since Knocked Up. And if you're interested in checking this out, it's actually dropped on video on demand. It's a universal production and it's part of the Universal's current rollout for video on demand that has really pissed off a lot of the big cinema chains, AMC Odeon, for example, who are really upset with um, with with Universal's policy here. And it means that you can now watch basically cinema uh, releases at home, which has been great for quarantine. We yeah. saw it as well with the Trolls sequel as well, which dropped early, which kind of started the furore. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can check this out on pretty much any channel where you can you can watch or pay for kind of box office video on demand content. It cost me 20 bucks here to rent it. Um, but I, I'd actually say it's worth it. And I, I, as I said, really enjoyed it. So an absolute uh, recommendation from me. Excellent. Up next, uh, The Five Bloods. Phil, what did you make of this one? Yeah, so this is the new Spike Lee film, Spike Lee directed film. came out yesterday on Netflix. It's about four uh, African-American Vietnam War vets uh, that return to Vietnam to look for the remains of their uh, squad leader and also a sort of fortune in gold bullion that he helped them to hide during the war. Um, I think it's a very relevant film to release at the moment yeah extremely i mean super relevant considering the the current atmosphere around the world um with the black lives matter movement um i I mean very it's almost like spike lee had the foresight of knowing where you know where the times were shifting and yeah and and an amazing time to launch it what what did you like about this? So I really enjoyed it. I think the, um, you know, it starts with some pretty uh, poignant imagery. Um, mm. 
uh, some of it's you know quite a difficult watch. It's some you know horrible sort of stock footage and stuff that they used. Um, but to a very good point, you know, to highlight sort of very important facts, uh, you know, to do with the time. Um, I think it had a really strong. You know, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into spoilers with this one. This is, mm. but I think it had a really strong for me sort of first hour, and it's a, it's a two. It's a how long is it? It's two and a half hours. I think this film. Mm. So, I think for me, it felt slightly long. Um, but and the first hour I felt was really strong, and then it, you know, character, certain characters start to unravel, and a lot of stuff happens. I yeah. think you'll agree. <laughs> a lot of um, stuff happens. Yeah, uh, but, you know, things that I liked, again, cinematography, I really liked it. I loved Mm. um, during, well, there's things I really liked and really loved. So when they go back uh, on the flashbacks to to the war, I really like it because he changes the aspect ratio of the screen. Yeah. And then he introduces that sort of like those really warm, oversaturated colors. Mm. And then he puts like a load of grain over it. It just makes it look full on sort of like seventies Vietnam war, you know, that footage that you're familiar mm. with seeing that. So those, those cine film sort of cameras, that kind of stuff was filmed on back in the day. Um, so I, I like that. And it sort of helps you, you know, it's like instantly, right. This is a flashback. But one thing I didn't like about the flashbacks is all the actors, uh, you know, I guess it was a artistic choice, but all the actors are the same age when they flash back apart from mm-hmm. obviously the, uh, the captain, squad leader. The squad leader. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, um, Stormin Norman, played by Chadwick Boseman, who's that's right. uh, Marvel's Black Panther. Yep. Um, but yeah, so they go back in, you know, on the flashbacks, they're all, so it's a bit weird because it, it, it's back, you know, in the late 60s, 70s, and it's, they're all the same age. They're all sort of what they are now, which would mm. be around sort of late, you know, uh, late 60s, 70s, something. Mm. Um, so that's a bit odd. Off, I found that's a bit off-putting. I think, mm-hmm. but I did like the, I did like the look of the flashback scenes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I actually disagree with you on um, on the the characters being recast as younger versions of themselves because I thought it it kind of explained the emotional turmoil that they went through at that time and have been going through since, and that mm. they're still the same people which for me, I think rammed home a lot of the emotion that, that the, the cast went through. Um, I think, you know, it starts off with a somewhat mixed tone of a movie. And, and at the start, you get a lot of this kind of film reel footage, which really sets up, you know, how, how black people and African Americans have fought uh, domestic and foreign wars. um, And, you know, and and that was really a really interesting setup because it it justified um, the needs of this squad going back to Vietnam to recover this gold for themselves, essentially, or for for their causes that they believed in. Mm. Um, but that that mixed tone was quite strange because it starts off after that a bit like the Hangover Part Two, where they kind of reunite and they're in bars and they're joking around. It then turns into like a like a kind of Apocalypse Now kind of movie along the way when they kind of go up the river and, you know, looking for Colonel Kurtz basically, which is, which is quite interesting. Less the heart of darkness, more the heart of lightness though. And then it ends up somewhere between kind of city slickers. So you get, you know, four, five people that are kind of out, out of their comfort zone. Um, You know, obviously older gentlemen kind of dealing with the struggles of a lot of physical activity as they, as they go to find this, uh, the gold. And then it turns into kind of a, a kind of gold heist spaghetti western, yeah. Um, right at the end, um, but where where a mixed tone for me and, and probably many people can so often be the downfall of a movie. I think Spike Lee gets his full point across with such a timely reminder that not only do Black Lives Matter, but that they always have, and in the many sacrifices that they've made, be it physically, mentally, or socially. Um, they've also been part of the many conflicts of, of war, which yeah. are for for quote unquote freedom of li- of fl- freedom or liberty. Um, and I I'm, I was I've I've already said this today, but I was really moved by this. I was actually moved. Um, 
to tears, basically, almost to tears. And I am now even even talking about it. I think particularly because of Delroy Lindo's performance as as Paul. Yeah. Who he's great, is yeah. the kind of make yeah, make America great again, cap wearing, Republican yet um PTSD troubled um former soldier. And and I think if he is not recognized for a fucking Oscar, um, then it's it's a travesty because that performance, there's a specific scene in there where he is so exhausted. I know which one you're going to say as well. <laughs> he kind of marches off into the into the bush, just screaming and and shouting, and his voice is is gravelly and broken. And holy hell, I was so moved by that. Yeah, um, you can hear my voice breaking a little bit just talking about it. I also loved the a cappella uh, version of of Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On." which was yeah. used throughout it. Just his voice without any backing music. I've never heard yeah, it. Yeah, it's really good. <sighs> Chills. Yeah, great soundtrack for this. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Amazing soundtrack. Um, I think all the, so, you know, for me, like, as you said, I think his, um, Delroy Lindo's performance was the strongest, but I think all the performances were really good. Yeah. Um, I think as like, as, you know, the ensemble was like, it was really well put together. I think, mm-hmm very believable you know as a group of old friends um and sort of you know comrades sort of thing but yeah i think it's yeah i really enjoyed it completely agree there was a really timely quote in there as well by chadwick boseman as storm and norman who obviously you know doesn't make it out of the first few scenes of the film and this isn't a spoiler this is in the description of the movie mm-hmm. but he he talks about how at home you know back home it's it's a police state and that that black communities live in fear of the police in their own homes. Holy shit. Like how, like Spike Lee, you know, struck gold with this before the, uh, the recent troubles uh, around the world. Um, but releasing this now is even more poignant. And, uh, you know, for me, this is an absolute recommendation. And if you have a Netflix mm-hmm. account or even if you don't, and you're looking at a free subscription, I recommend watching this, especially if you're interested or trying to understand a lot of the issues that um, that the world is facing right now. How about yourself, Phil? What did you what did you think of this? Yeah, no, I agree completely. I think it's the kind of thing you're watching it and you think, oh my god, like this is so relevant. Like it feels like they must have gone out and shot a few of these scenes like last week, right? Just to put yeah. them in the film, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's yeah, it's definitely one to watch. It's and that but that said, tells you how how blinkered and sheltered many of us are, not knowing or thinking about these as issues, and seeing something that was made pre George Floyd um, being released now, and thinking, wow, have they gone and reshot this? Have they gone and this stuff has been going on for so long? And <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think yeah. it's it's a wake up call. Yeah, absolutely. But- so. To five bloods then a recommendation from the movie mouth podcast uh next we're gonna switch it up a little bit we're gonna go a little bit lighter i promise i didn't cry through this one um <laughs> well maybe for the wrong reasons um so sir kenneth branner directs this disney plus movie artemis fowl which is based on a series of best-selling children's books uh it sees a 12 year old boy whose father played by colin farrell goes missing leading our hero to enter a magical world of fairies and trolls as he tries to unravel the mystery. So I think this film is its essentially a children's version of the Hellboy-type universe with kind of mythical creatures colliding with the real world. Okay. Um, the cast that they've assembled for this is pretty amazing. Um, so obviously you've, you've got, you know, as I mentioned, Colin Farrell as, uh, as Artemis's dad. You've got Dame Judi Dench, who is basically playing... Uh, M, but it's M of the Fairy Special Forces unit who are known as Leprechaun. <laughs> right. You have uh, Josh Gad, who is having a huge amount of fun as the non-dwarf dwarf. He's basically a big dwarf, um, <laughs> which is a joke that they play throughout. Um, and he's playing a slightly new role here for him because, you know, his usual kind of comedy, you know, schlub type type role. Is, is there, but he's also kind of a Han Solo meets Jack Sparrow type character as well. So he's he's a bit of a swashbuckler in this. Okay. Um, really tightly directed, uh, nice and short, <laughs> an hour 30. And you know, if that's a pro, then I'm going to be coming onto the cons pretty soon. <laughs> um, 
but you know, a lot of a lot of expensive CGI. I loved the introduction to the fairy underworld, which was really reminiscent of the shots that that Branagh put together for uh, the first Thor movie. When when you see the intro to Asgard, the camera kind of flying around this mythical city, very similar. And I, I liked that. Yeah. Um, right, right at the start. I would say the the main issues with this are the script, which had some seriously clunky lines that the young cast seemed to really struggle with. Mm. Um, Artemis Fowl, who was played by um, a young actor called Ferdia Shaw, didn't, for me, have a great amount of range, um, which I feel bad for saying because he's a kid um, and I'm not an actor. Um, but he, he was slightly off-putting in, in much of this film with his line delivery. Right. Um, but it might this might be due to the script, you know. Um, and another issue is that Artemis Fowl... Um, is basically a rich white kid with a black butler. He has everything. At the start of the movie, we see him doing tricks on a surfboard in a wetsuit. We see him riding around the forest on a hoverboard. And to be honest, I prefer my child heroes to be a little bit more earthy and probably more better acquainted with an ironing board than a hoverboard, unless it's Molly <laughs> McFly we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, you know, see the examples of Harry Potter or Katniss Everdeen in a lot of these young adult movies, characters that have had hardship. This kid has it all. And it doesn't help that every line he has is so smug that you're hoping something bad happens to him just to teach him a real life lesson. (laughs) This, this kid's basically already won at life by the start of the film. And it makes it so hard to want him to succeed. And this is possibly more of a problem with the source material than the film itself. But sadly, I'd say this is a miss for me. Um, maybe it's lost on me as I'm, I'm neither a, a reader of the books or a young child. Um, if you have kids, I'm sure it would, you know, take their mind off um, for, for at least uh, an hour and 30 minutes. And maybe if you're a fan of the books, you'd love it. But for me, um, I'm sad to say it's, it's a miss. So, in a slight change up to our regular format, we're now going to jump to a spoiler special. And uh, this is a, a movie that dropped on Netflix um, over a week ago now uh, that's had such bad reviews, it's garnered a 0% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> um, so we figured that we'd watch it for you so that you don't have to. This, ladies and gentlemen, is... The last days of American crime. Phil, where do you oh, want to start? Where do we begin? So, <laughs> so this is directed by um, Olivier Megaton, which is like the coolest name ever that came out. I thought this is a good start. And he, <laughs> I mean, that is a cool name, Olivier Megaton. So he's known for um, Transporter 3, Taken uh, two and three, uh, and uh, Columbiana as well. Yeah, um, basically a- any any movie that Luc Besson wrote but didn't want to direct because it was absolute trash. <laughs> it's like has been a, has been directed by Olivier Megaton. It's like it's a specialist in taking sequels for films that didn't need to be made. Exactly. Yeah. Tell us so, about the plot. <laughs> the plot. So it's based on a uh, 2009 graphic novel. Um, mm-hmm. And it's set in the not too distant future of 2025 in a sort of crime ridden US. Um, and the government are going to introduce the API, which is the American Peace Initiative. So this is a technology that sends out um, like a brain signal uh, supposedly making it impossible for citizens to commit any crime so i mean you know when i read that i thought that's an interesting sort of premise let's let's uh let's give it a go but i mean yeah where do we start it's the thing is what i will say is it does look good the film does look really good i think it's got really good locations i think it's got you know, it's nice and crisp. It gives you a really sort of, you know, it's very sort of dystopian feel to the whole, 
you know what's going on there's lots of rioting on the streets going on the streets are you know again they do make timely for for today's world (laughs) yeah which was weird another movie where i was like oh wow they're in north america and they are rioting and there are cars on fire in the street and but that's pretty much where i think any semblance of, of reality kind of disappears yeah i mean cast wise you've got um so the main character is uh can we just can we just hype this up a little bit yeah go on so you've got edgar edgar ramirez in the lead role here who is extremely one note he is he He's like a, watching a piece of cardboard and he's actually very good. I've seen him in a few things. The assassination of, of Gianni Versace, where he was Gianni Versace. Very good. In this, um, he has probably n- not much to work from, from a, from a script perspective, but Phil, tell us what is this hard hitting action hero's name? Graham Brick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Graham, that's a good one. Isn't it? Every what? time someone called him Graham or Brick, <laughs> yeah. I just was, I cried with laughter. <laughs> I couldn't take it seriously from that point. I mean, Graham Brick. Graham. Is, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it's also got Michael Pitt in it, who plays yep. Kevin mm. Cash. Uh, and I must say, Michael Pitt doing his best audition to play the next Joker possible. <laughs> Like, as, as soon as I saw him, like two minutes on the screen, I was like, this just feels like he's trying to be the Joker. I mean, again, I, I'm yeah. not familiar with the graphic novel, so I have no idea what Kevin Cash as a character is like in the graphic novel. <laughs> but this sort of completely unhinged son of a, you, you know, he's he's the son of um, a gangster, loads of money and just, yeah, sort of got everything he wants. Mm. designer clothes but absolutely oily and unhinged <laughs> but i i mean yeah I, it's funny you said that when you said that because i was thinking exactly the same thing literally as i was watching it i was like i was actually actually thinking oh maybe he'd be a good joker and then the rest of the movie was so bad and there's some scenes that are so terrible where i couldn't distance his performance from how bad the actual movie was yeah well, it's you know it's nothing against Michael Pitt because he's not at all. He was great. He's given Michael. it his all. He's absolutely he, given, he's, he's having going a lot of fun. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. He plays an unhinged. He chews gangster. every piece of scenery in this movie. He's he's gnawed on his teeth marks are all over the wall. <laughs> yeah, and he's great. You know, he, he's sort of good at playing that unhinged character. But you know, he's we know he's good. Like he was, yeah, you know, great in Boardwalk Empire, and yeah, I just think. It's... Did you catch his Groundhog Day reference? No. There's a moment where, and, and maybe I should, we should just rewind a little bit, but the, the plot basically revolves around these two pair of imbeciles um, <laughs> trying to commit a, the final big bank heist before this API is unleashed and, and uh, American citizens can no longer commit crimes. So they're kind of going for it. They're ramping it up. They're trying to do the big, you know, the big score before they retire, which is like every score movie, heist movie, ever um but there is a scene when they first meet up and uh they go back to kevin cash's uh, played by michael pitt's lair and graham brick is walking through this warehouse and there's a trip wire in there and yeah michael pitt tells him to be careful yeah to stop and look out for that first step because it's a doozy oh Just- he does yeah, uh, just oh, like I'm ashamed Ned of Ryerson in so fucking shit. Groundhog Day. Yeah, um, wow. I, I, I kind of yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it would just be funny. This film but, up in my my books now. I'll watch it again. <laughs> this is the problem. It this is why we're watching it for you, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think this is a good idea to watch it. It's two and a half hours of hell. Um, the opening scene. There's an opening scene in this where Graham Brick is having a he's having a, a nice drink on his own. Great. And our female lead comes to join him and she walks up to him and basically seduces him immediately uh, and says, I want to check something off my bucket list. And then she kind of walks suggestively into the toilet of this bar. So he then follows her in and they have some 
you know, pretty graphic sex in the bathroom against the wall, which I don't know if you noticed, but was actually moving as he was having sex, (laughs) like it was made out of cardboard. Um, While also playing the, uh, a version of now I want to be your dog um, over the top of it very loudly. So he's about to leave. And as he turns around, um, he says to her, so what, what, what did we just check off of your bucket list? And she looks at him and without, dropping a beat says fuck a loser <laughs> <laughs> yeah and this is um, uh, i had a real problem with how women were portrayed in this film in the opening scene you see a woman st- stood on a car with fake breasts topless oh yeah um, i forgot about she that. was the the lead was always our our kind of heroine who was in trouble um you know getting into problems there were very few you know, women in these roles, apart from Michael Pitt's sister that was in a short role again, wearing a short skirt, you know, being suggestive. Um, it wasn't a lot for the female cast uh, to do to do in this. No. What and else did you notice about this movie? I think, well, it's also got um, Sholto Copley in it from mm. District 9. And District 9. Yeah. Chappie and, wait, and yeah. uh, Elysium. Yeah. Yes, and the yeah. A Team as well. I think he played. Yeah. Uh, who was it? He played played uh, Murdoch. Murdoch, that's it. Yeah, yeah, of the remake. And I was sort of excited when I saw it. I didn't know he was in it, and then you know he came on. I, I'm a big. I really like his stuff. And um, but he plays the most pointless character. That there's like no reason. Like they start mm. this side, uh, you know, sort of focus of he plays a a, poli- a policeman, and but it doesn't go anywhere. And then they link no. the characters together at the end, but for the most, and he just turns out to be insane. Basically he just goes <laughs> insane. I didn't get It's almost the like they went for this kind of like tra- Travis Bickle kind of um, taxi driver style police um, officer who's yeah, like, like by get, the getting book. unhinged, cruising the city of Detroit by the book, but you know, getting unhinged because he kills that guy in the first scene that you see him, you know, point blank with his gun and yeah. doesn't seem to have very, any remorse. And then he's driving around the streets that are, he's getting battered in his car and he's just driving into people. Um, so I think they were kind of going for that angle. I feel like this movie was so long that maybe there was even more that they shot and it was more of Shalto Copley oh. driving around. It was you know, so long committing heinous acts. That's the other it, thing. I mean, I like just didn't. Why didn't they even make be... a sh- make a make a TV show out of it? Why didn't they just t- break it up into you know make it a mini series? Because it, it was two and a half hours long. Episodes. It was you know it, yeah, and an hour in, and I I didn't want to watch anymore. But I couldn't sort of not watch it either. <laughs> I was, I was, I mean, I was probably like ten minutes in, and I and I was I was done with it. Um, you know what? You know what I found funny though was that last week in uh, episode one we were we were talking about. Uh, <laughs> Bad Boys and uh, yeah, Bad Boys. Too, I know exactly in, what you're going to say. Cuba in <laughs> in their bright yellow Humvee, and what pops up on screen? But a Kevin Chrome Cash's Humvee, Chrome Humvee. <laughs> I was like, whoa! They've just outdone the Humvee stakes. A Chrome Humvee. Yeah. So next week on the Movie Mouse podcast, we're going to be reviewing another movie that also has a Humvee in it <laughs> of, a, of a different shade. I was exactly the same. That's so funny. That you noticed that. Yeah. There was um, a great line in there. I loved, I loved, there was a scene um, where it was right at the start of the movie. So Graham Brick um, is, you see him in a, in a kind of hotel room or, or an apartment complex or something. And there's a guy in a bathtub full of gasoline. And he's obviously Graham, Graham Brick's obviously exacted some form of revenge on him for some, for something. And he he gives him a cigar. So he lights his cigar and this guy's obviously freaking out because he's in a bathtub full of you know gasoline and he's going to go up any minute. Um, we then see him walk out of the apartment building and there's a huge explosion. Later in the movie, the tables are turned and our hero, Graham Brick, has been tied up to a chair. In walks the guy from scene one, uh, albeit with a face full or... A, Skinful, as you as you could say, of third degree burns. I say he, he, um, he doesn't walk in. I say he limps in a bit. Well, he kind of yeah, he kind of shambles in, <laughs> shambles. into shot, um, covered in um, in burns, and he's chomping a cigar, so he's smoking away, and uh, and he starts um, kind of throwing gasoline over Graham Brick. He's going to kind of com- commit the same kind of red. But I just loved this was one one line I love, where Brick just looks up at him and says, 
I thought you quit smoking. <laughs> Which I was just like, <laughs> like you should quit have just smoking. Like, Shut up, he Graham. Was on fire. Like he was on fire, and then he was put out, and he'd been smoking. You know, literally for a while, but yeah. also because he was smoking a cigar, which I just, I, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just <laughs> bizarre. Yeah. It just goes off the scale on bizarre as well, doesn't it? As well. The, the um, scene where they go to Kevin Cash's dad's mansion. I mean, <laughs> it's just... so there's a scene just to set this up. There's a scene in the middle of the movie that for no apparent reason, Kevin Cash played by Michael Pitt decides to take Edgar Ramirez um, as Graham Brick in their Chrome Humvee to their, to his dad's house while his dad's having a party to talk to him about something that I don't even remember because the plot is so confusing and, and bizarre. They're there to steal warheads so they can break into a safe. <laughs> they, of course, would have. I'm glad you remembered and followed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and they walk in to this wood panelled office with <laughs> Michael Pitt's father there and sister. Yeah. But then they just... All... <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, the just chaos happens and they start basically screaming at each other like all of them because the sister's in there as well she's no, do you know why they scream at each other do you remember why wasn't it because he uh, oh yeah because michael pitt had slept with his dad's fiance wife so he basically slept with his stepmother but yep. then he and then the dad had killed her <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> and he was like why did you do that? She was always my favorite. He's like, because you fucked her. <laughs> <laughs> and then they start screaming at each other. And then the sister starts actually screaming like lines that I couldn't even make out. They're yeah. being shrieked. All yeah. goes mental. And um, he ends up getting a tomahawk and putting it in his dad's head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, True it's story. Just, I can't. That whole scene, I was like, what? I hell? actually love that scene. I actually I love right. that scene. That's that's the only thing I liked about the movie, just because I had no fucking idea what was going on. <laughs> and, and I felt like they just made up this random argument just so they could say, he's going to now kill his father and there has to be a reason. What's the reason? Oh, he slept with his second wife. Um, and then, you know, the dad had the second wife killed and Michael Pitt's really upset about that. Yeah. Um, but I did like, I liked when they when they first walked into the room and they're trying to set the dad up as being a really bad guy so that we hate him immediately. And Michael Pitt walks in first. Edgar Ramirez walks in, who obviously the dad has never met before. And and the dad just looks, turns to Michael Pitt, looks at Edgar Ramirez and goes, who's this piece of shit? <laughs> and it's like this, this poor guy. Like he's just walked in the room. Um, but uh, he he deserved what he got at the end of the day. Oh yeah, and he, I mean, he, not only did he get a, an ice pick in the in the head or whatever it was, a tomahawk in the head. I think it was a tomahawk. He also got shot a lot after he died as well. <laughs> oh, he did, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, yeah. And then they take they took a, a an RPG or a rocket launcher of some kind and blew a hole in the wall to escape and ran down another set of stairs. And then and then Michael Pitt also shot and killed his sister oh, in yeah. the lobby of for, of the house just for good measure. Um, did did you notice? Did you notice the accents in this? Did you notice many of the American accents in it? No, I, I, I was distracted by. How so it was. first, so firstly, everyone in this movie was supposed to be American, um, which is fine, um, but I noticed everyone had a slightly off American accent, and I also noticed that Detroit, having been to Detroit, no, no matter whether it was in the not too distant future or not that this looked nothing like Detroit or really anywhere in the United States of America. I also noted noticed that the supporting cast appeared to be made up by um, what can only be described as flies and bugs in every shot, climbing over people's faces and hair, um, which sounds like I was tripping, but, but, but they were there. Um, and even more so, more relevant in 4K. Ultra HD. Mm. So, so I was like, "Where? What is going on here?" So I googled this, and it was actually filmed in Johannesburg, <laughs> in South oh, Africa. Okay, and 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 therefore all of the like the ensemble cast that they had, uh, apart from the two two or three main leads, were all from South Africa or all you know local. Oh. So the accents were really off. It kept. I was like, "What? 
where are these people supposed to be from? Why does this not look like Detroit? Why does it, doesn't this look like America? Why are there flies climbing on everybody in every scene and buzzing around the camera? <laughs> and it's because they filmed it in, in South Africa. Wow. I didn't know that. That was very observant. Yeah. One of those things, I think, when you watch so many movies that you, you kind of pick up on. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, you know, it sounds like this was a lot of fun to, to watch. Um, but I have to tell you, this is terrible. This was truly, truly awful. Yeah. It deserves zero, zero. And I like, I like a lot of bad films. I like a lot of bad films, but this was a bad film. I didn't really like. Joyless. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and absolutely does not get a recommendation from the movie mouth podcast this week. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. Down, Graham Brick. <laughs> Graham, go away, Graham. I don't want to see you again. <laughs> so um, that was the last days of American crime. Then uh, this week we are going to our video store corner, <laughs> and we are going to discuss um, the 1988 Robert De Niro, Charles Grodin two header comedy, Midnight Run, which I've actually never seen and i know people rave about this and i feel terrible considering i am the co-host of a movie podcast so i'm ashamed but we are in the very careful loving hands warm (laughs) some would say hands of phil who's going to tell us all about it yeah so you feel terrible i've never i hadn't heard of it Uh, and i I love (laughs) all of these kind of 80s buddy movies i'd not i don't know how but i'd not heard of it I'd never seen it, and I was just skipping through on Netflix. I saw the poster. I was like, "That is cool. What's that about? Midnight Run? That sounds eighties. Sounds like a you know, sort of like Outrun and something else, like a eighties game." So, yeah, it stars Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. Um, obviously, you know, you don't really need to introduce De Niro. Charles Grodin was the only thing I remembered Charles Grodin from. And I feel a bit bad for this. Was he plays the father in Beethoven. Harry and the Hendersons was it well I oh no, it that. Yeah, no do you know what and I said exa- I thought that, that exact thought in my head but that's John Lithgow right in Harry and the Hendersons yes of course it is but or was there a TV series of Harry and the Hendersons it was definitely Beethoven you're so but he right. was yeah he was the dad in Beethoven yeah and he was absolutely brilliant in it hilarious it also features um Yaphek uh Yaphet Cotto who is from um the running man and he's also in alien as well uh, this you know this film's got a great 80s like cast it's great so you've got uh, john aston who's uh from beverly hills cop and you've got joe pantoliano who we know from the goonies the matrix bad boys again linking to last week um and then we've got i love dennis farina i just seen dennis farina yeah there's dennis farina in there as well in get shorty yeah so it's, it's a real great cast. It's, so it's directed by um, Martin Brest, and he directed Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Meet Joe Black, and Scent of a Woman as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Hoorah! <laughs> so you can definitely Hoorah! see the sort of, it feels like that sort of, yeah, that sort of Beverly Hills Cop type uh, 80s feel to it. It's great. Kind of buddy comedy. Yeah. yeah. So and what it's about, so you've got... Um, so Robert De Niro is tasked by Joe Pantoliano's character and he's so Joe Pantoliano plays like a, a bail bonds um, agent, basically. So he gives bounty hunters uh, of which Robert De Niro is one um, a job to find a, a mob accountant who is on the run from the mob. Because he's mob accountant, if you will, mob accountant, yeah, <laughs> um, and that's and the accountant's played by Charles Grodin. Um, so it's to find him. He's on the run from the mob and also the law, obviously, because there's a there's a it, it's, it, he's being hunted by bounty hunters as well, and he's worth a lot of money to them because, um, yeah, the mob want him dead basically because he stole. Mm. I think it's like fifteen million dollars or something from the mob. So not only are the mob after them, but so is Robert De Niro. Um, so he has to go and find him and bring him back to Los Angeles. And it just, 
goes through this crazy set of like it's like it turns into at that point when they get together it sort of turns into like a a funny road movie of them trying to get back from um various places back to la Mm. by a certain time because when it gets past a certain time the um the bail's like not active anymore or you won't get the money for him. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just get, turns into like this cross country uh, chase and he has to ev- evade like the FBI who are after him, the mob who are after him. And it, and also um, John Aston who plays a character called Mar from Beverly, who is also in Beverly Hills cop. And he plays a, another bounty hunter called Marvin Dorfler. And he's really good as well. So yeah, it's just a, uh, it's just one of those films. I think, how have I missed this? It's it's genuinely. I laughed a lot watching this, and it was it was great. And it's definitely one I'll I'll, I'll carry on watching because it's just a great stick it on. It's a couple of hours long, um, and it just goes along with those sort of. It you know, harks back to those eighties. Like it, I, for me, it's up there with the eighties comedies that I really like, like National Lampoon's Vacation. Mm. Trains, planes, and automobiles. Beverly Hills Cop, and you know, Police Academy. All those. It's sort of, I, I really like it, and it's got that, yeah, it's got that great eighties cast as well. What would you, what would you recommend alongside this? I mean, you mentioned that, you know, it's up there with a lot of the eighties comedies. If if someone likes this, or maybe likes other movies from the same period, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, I'd say some of the ones I've mentioned there, maybe. Yeah, one's definitely like Beverly Hills Cop. Again, same director, similar mm-hmm. sort of feel, similar type of comedy. Um, maybe something like uh, Stir Crazy as well. Yeah. It would be, it'd be a, a good one. Yeah, that's, you know, a similar sort of thing, uh, you know. And also along the lines of that film, uh, Hear No Evil, See No Evil as well would be a great one. Oh. Um, yeah, so anything Richard like that. If you like, yeah, if you like those kind of films, you're going to love this. Um, love those two handers. Did you know... Did you know that this spawned some sequels? What Midnight Run did? Yeah. I did not know that. They all have less than uh, 6% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it spawned three sequels. Really? Yes, it did. Um, with uh, It was quite strange, actually, because it appears that um, both of the primary cast members... Yeah, uh, were removed from this movie, including Robert De Niro. And Robert De Niro's character, Jack Walsh, was actually played by Christopher McDonald, which if you know your um, 90s comedies, he was the guy who played Shooter McGavin uh, in Happy Gilmore. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so he basically became the, the character. So we had, there was another Midnight Run, which was, I mean, really, you know, well done for thinking of that one. That's like another four then- hours. <laughs> Exactly. There was then Midnight Runaround. Oh, this is bringing and it down. And then finally, the, and then finally, before it it fell off a cliff in a blazing inferno, Midnight Run for Your Life. No, I'm not watching any of those. I'm not I'm not doing that. All of which starred Christopher McDonald, and uh, it doesn't look like anybody from the the primary cast were were then in in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see any of those. This because this one's great. And I said, it's available on Netflix now. Um, massively recommended if you fancy a good, and it just the perform the comic performances are so good in it as well. Just De Niro's great at comedy, but Charles Grodin yeah. just plays this annoying, the accountant and some of the dialogue between him and De Niro when like he's, you know, De Niro's like stuck handcuffed to him or, you know, on a train or mm. on a, um, <laughs> on a on a coach or something. There's some really funny lines. Um, it's just great. Yeah. You're talking about their two characters. I can hear some title music starting, and it it's interesting. It takes me back to the '90s. I think it's tonight on Stars in Their Eyes, <laughs> Phil. Yes. Where we will choose characters from the video store corner movie and decide on who would play who from your two hosts. So, Phil, you have the annoying, irritating Charles Grodin character to pick from and the <laughs> the the handsome, determined character played by Robert De Niro. Which which one would you pick for me? Which one would you pick for you? You would be the annoying accountant. 
100 percent you'd be i'd be trying to just have a quiet nap on a train and you'd be asking me lots of annoying pointless questions about yeah just nothing in particular and you'd be prodding me <laughs> and you wouldn't leave me alone that's basically how you are in real life and i'd be you know just telling you to shut up and maybe leave. we could start the midnight movie mouth podcast well why don't we just if there's a I wonder who owns like the license to this because we, we could perhaps star in the next midnight what would we call it midnight midnight run what, what was the last one called midnight run midnight, for your life midnight run for your life oh maybe we could uh midnight oh, i don't know i can't even think of anything but we midnight could we could running do the... back to you midnight i'm gonna run to you no midnight yeah maybe yeah that midnight work. run to you midnight yeah. run to you yeah but that sounds that. like it might be a rom-com do you know what I mean? Midnight mm. Run to You. It's like, but we know, like we know maybe... song, but then we've got the song for the soundtrack straight away. So. I'm going to run to you. <laughs> yeah. By Brian Adams. That sounds, yeah, you're right, though. It does sound like a romantic And then now. basically, basically, I've been arrested and you're coming to bail bonds me out, but you're also in love with me. And <laughs> then um, you travel across the country to come and find me. And it's all about them actually, this time, actually finding each other rather than it being they're both stuck together. Hollywood, yeah. if you're listening, um, please send us an email at moviemouthpodcast at gmail.com and we are willing to take offers in excess of 50, 60 million. We have to talk about that. We need to discuss this. All right, we'll, we'll talk about the numbers, but, you know, call us, get in touch with us. Yeah. All right, so that was Video Store Corner. Um, next week, we're going to be reviewing something else from our past or maybe something we've never seen before. So, on next week's Movie Mouth podcast, we're going to be reviewing Joseph Gordon-Levitt's new airplane hijack movie, 7500, and Kevin Bacon's new haunted house haunting a man thriller, You Should Have Left, along with all the regular fun and movie games and questions. So, in the meantime, please find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Alexa, and TuneIn. Please give us a nice five-star review and subscribe if you have the chance. And we look forward to speaking with you next week. Philip. Yes. Good day to you, sir. Good day. No, I said good day. I said good day. Bye, Phil. See you later.